the bride of Christ. You can see here the holy city, New Jerusalem. Where is the holy city, New Jerusalem, right now? It's in heaven, right? When Jesus was on the earth and he gave, uh, he gave his apostles, his disciples, a promise. And he said that he goes to prepare what? A new Jerusalem. A uh, new Jerusalem or a place for you. And if I prepare that place, I will, if, I, if I go, I will come again to receive you and you'll, you'll forever be with me. He's going to take us back. That was the promise. He's going to take us back. Well, think about how wonderful this holy city is. In six days, he created the earth, according to Genesis. Now, there's theories on whether the, the earth was um, recreated in that six-day six, uh, period. But just taking Genesis, just going through it literally, it looks like six days... On the seventh day, he rested. So it's not even seven days. It's six days, right? So it took, it took Jesus, he's the creator, six days to create the earth. How long has he been working on the new, the heavenly city of Jerusalem? Over 2,000 years. And he's doing that just for you. I mean, when you look, some people, I've heard some people say, I just want a little hut somewhere, you know. Not me. When, when I hear about that golden city, I mean, I'm not saying I deserve any more, but I don't want any less. <laughs> right. I want to see those golden streets. Mansion. And that mansion, he said he, would, he was preparing a mansion for us. Yes, thank you, brother. And uh, how many are looking forward to it? I certainly am. So we're going to get right into the scripture here. Revelation chapter 19, 7. And you can all read that up there, right? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. You can see the title of the slide up there, the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ is who? The church. The church, right? The faithful, true, believing church the bride of Christ. And this first verse here, 19.7, kind of alerts us that the Lamb is coming back. It says here that the marriage of the Lamb is come. A marriage has always been a time of celebration and re rejoicing, especially a Jewish wedding. Incidentally, do you know how, how long a Jewish wedding lasted? Seven days. Seven days. You know how long we'll be in heaven for that marriage ceremony? Seven years. Is that coincidental or what? I don't think it's coincidental. I think that's what the seven days represented. Praise God. Amen. But this is something to rejoice about. So let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. How do you make yourself ready? See, a lot of people think, well, making myself ready, I got to do, do this, and I got to do that, and I got to do this. And you know what? If you need to repent, you should repent, right? If you need some things you need to straighten out, you should straighten them out. But I think when it's talking about making yourself ready, you best make sure that you got oil in your lamp. Remember that song? Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning, keep me burning to the break of day. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna. Tonight. I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm not the entertainment tonight, but uh, yeah, so uh, praise God. So for the marriage of the Lamb has come, the great rejoicing, and his wife has made herself ready. I, I just feel like I, I need to tell you this. I learned years ago something that I had never heard before, and that's why I'm sharing it just now. I feel the Holy Spirit said, share this. The word rejoice. Sometimes you go to churches and people just kind of just, you know, 
don't really get into it. And I know sometimes, I mean, sometimes you feel like that. Sometimes I feel like that. Most of the time when I'm up there playing music, I'm just concentrating on it. But the word rejoice, the word rejoice means to spin yourself around. Have you ever seen that where somebody, I mean, they're just spinning themselves around? You can only do that so much, so, so many times, and then you'll, you know, you get dizzy. Right, right. But that's what that means. And I can just imagine in heaven, when we're taken up to heaven, we have seven years, we're going to be up there rejoicing. That means the Holy Spirit's just going to come on us individually. Just, you'll be sitting at the table, and all of a sudden, woo! And you'll get up and you'll start spinning around because you realize, I am in the presence of God. I made it. Amen. I made it. Amen. But the lamb has made her, or, or, or the, the wife has made herself ready. I believe your salvation is in Christ alone. Making yourself ready is trusting in the word of God. Trusting in the promises of God. Trusting in the blood of Christ, the faithfulness of God. That to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. And that tells me that there's no spot or blemish on this bride. See, you may have spots and blemishes now. But when you're caught up, the Bible says your, your body's going to put on immortality. You're going to have an eternal body. Like his, when he rose from the... You're going to get that, that body like he had when he rose from the dead. There's not going to be any blood in it. Flesh and blood can't enter into the kingdom of God. But you'll have blood and bone. And you'll be able to do things like he did. Like when he left, he just ascended up into heaven. Right? His feet were on, standing on the Mount of Olives. And when he went up, the disciples just like were gawking. Well, what? You know, he just kept rising. And, I, and all of a sudden, the angels were standing there and said, what are you doing? What are you looking at? This same Jesus is going to come back the same way he left. And I've heard people, I've, down through the years, I've heard people who are, uh, who think they're the second coming of Christ. And I'm not trying to be funny on that. There's people that actually have claimed Mary Baker Eddy. If you've heard of Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Science, she was the founder of Christian Science. She said she was a second coming of Christ, but she was the female version. The second coming of Christ is going to be a reality, but his feet are going to touch right down on the Mount of Olives. And I, I don't think that she was ever in the Mount of Olives, on the Mount of Olives. But the, the scripture says he's going to come back the same way he left. In other words, he ascended, he will descend right upon that mountain. And the prophecy says when his feet touch the mountain, there will be this great earthquake. That'll get people's attention. Plus, you have to realize also that Armageddon is there, right? All the nations have been gathered together waiting for him. He's coming on that white horse with us behind him. He's going to get off that white horse and descend right down on that Mount of Olives. Praise God. But she was granted she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You, you, you notice it, it says she should be arrayed. It was granted her that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. In other words, she didn't appear, she didn't come up that way. There's nothing you can do to make you that way. And this is the righteousness of the saints. Your righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Your righteousness is of me. There's nothing you can do to make yourself perfect. You will be perfect, though. You will be perfect in heaven. And he says unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, don't you want to be called in the marriage supper? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if you 
all this time that you were in church, but you just didn't believe? Now, I, I believe that the people that are here tonight, I believe that the people that are, are interested in hearing the word, they're not going to have any problem. They're, they're here because they believe. They're here because they have a desire to hear the word. Blessed are they who are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Revelation 20, 21, we're getting into here. And he's still talking about the bride. He said, and there came unto me one of the seven angels. You'll notice in Revelation, seven, seven this, seven, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven angels, right? Uh, and there uh, came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, come hither, or come here, I will shew thee or show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And this almost, as you read this, it almost causes you to, to do a 180, I think, if you were looking at it, because you're expecting to see the bride, and the bride, the bride of Christ is people, right? But listen to this. He carried me. I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And then he carried me into the spirit uh, in the spirit to the great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So when he said, I'll show you the bride, he showed him the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Why is it called the bride? I believe because the bride is the inhabitants of the holy city. The bride is inside the city. And so the city represents the bride. And it's descending out of heaven from God. So it's in heaven. We asked before, where is it now? It's in heaven. But it's not going to stay in heaven forever. It's going to eventually descend down and, and, and it's going to take up residence right upon this earth. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like jasper, clear as crystal, and she and it had a great wall, great and high. Trump should be here. You know, he always wants to build the wall, build the wall, build remember the oh, the campaign, I'm gonna build a wall, I'm gonna build a well it, this has a great wall. Maybe that's where he got it from. And it had twelve gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And that tells me, ain't nobody getting, there's only 12 gates, and ain't nobody getting in there past those angels. If you don't belong there, you know, it's like uh, some of us have, uh, you, you work security, don't you? A lot of places, you have to have a badge to get in. If you don't belong in that city, there ain't no way you're getting past those angels. You you think Victor here is 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 tough to deal with? What do you got? What are you gonna do if you have to uh, come confronted with an eight foot angel? Michael. <laughs> or Michael. Yeah. <laughs> Having the glory of God in her light was like a a stone, most precious, even jasper, so clear as crystal. She had a great uh, a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gate the gates twelve angels, and the names written therein, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Well, that's kind of interesting. Because the 12 tribes, when we think of the bride, we usually think about the church, but we don't really usually think about the 12 tribes of Israel. And what, you, what I, I hope you can see is that God had his Jewish bride, and that was the first bride or covenant, and then he took, him, he could, took out a Gentile bride, which a lot, of, a lot of Jews came in at the same time, but he's got two different brides. In, in this holy city, he's merging them to, together. And the church doesn't take away the blessing from Israel. Israel has their names on all of the gates. That tells me that many people who are teaching the, that uh, we don't need the Old Testament, we only need the New Testament. 
I think all you got to do is look at this, this passage here. If you're going through the holy city, those gates have the names of Israel on it. And I think that's saying you need, if you're going to get in this city, you need those books of the Old Testament. You need to understand that. But at the same time, we didn't read this, but the, the, the city has the 12 foundations. You remember what, whose names are on the 12 foundations? The 12 apostles. You cannot base your salvation without having those writings of the, the 12 apostles. You're just, you're just not going to be believing the right thing. And so it, tell, it shows me that the bride of Christ loves and possesses the, the Old Testament and the New Testament and is a product of both. Praise, praise God. Now let's go to Ephesians here. And this is a kind of an interesting scripture because this is where Paul introduces this whole concept of the bride of Christ, the church being the bride of Christ. And this was a mystery hidden in, in Paul, or a mystery hidden uh, from, from mankind until Paul was given a revelation. And so it comes out here in the book of Ephesians. In fact, there's a lot of things. Remember I said that in, in uh, the 12th mystery we were going to talk about was the book of Ephesians. I said, that's the Holy of Holies in the New Testament. And it's got a lot of good things hidden in there, and we're going to pick, we're going to kind of pick some of those things up for our last um, when we get on talking about that twelfth mystery. But we read here in Ephesians five twenty two through thirty three: Wives, submit. Uh oh. Wives hate that word, right? Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband, as unto the Lord. Now, how many of you have, how many have known men that would go home and try to drive their their wives into uh, down on the floor to bow before them as if they were Lord? That's not what that's talking about. Any guy that thinks he that he was given that wife to lord it over like that, just think about this. In Egypt. When they were uh, whipping the, the Israelites, did God hear their cry? That was only a short time, and then they were delivered with a supernatural hand. And for you, as a husband, to think that it's up, it's okay for you to beat your wife into submission because you're the Lord over this castle, the king over the castle, Lord of this house. That's just not what this is, this is talking about. Let's, let's look at, now as we read it, you'll see, it'll come, it's going to come right out. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Let's read that again. The husband is the head of the wife. Who, who came first? The husband came first. Adam came first. The wife came second. Husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So, women, you ought to realize that you're in that uh, position in the marriage. But the headship, the spiritual headship, is supposed to be upon, the responsibility upon the husband. Now, it's very sad, but many of our husbands don't take their God-given role. But, but notice that the important thing, how you think, is the next one. He says that, that even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So instead of men thinking that they should be lording it over their wife, they should be repenting, going before God and saying, God, I know I'm tasked with being a savior of the body, the savior of this marriage, the helper of this one who you've given me to love and to care for and to meet every need. We go to God and we say, Lord, you said you'd meet every need according to your riches and glory. Well, what if God's response is, I'm going to meet your needs the same way you meet the needs of your wife? 
There's going to be a lot of upset men, and, and, but I see the parallel here. As Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. What if you start looking at your wife like Christ looks at you? A glorified, I mean, we just read it. With the, 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 uh, the glorified wife has made herself ready, not one spot, no blemish. What if you looked at your wife like that? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife. Watch, watch it. You, you, think, you think it's, some people say, oh, this is against women. No, watch this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it. I think some marriages would change if the wife felt like her husband was truly given his, pouring out his life into that marriage. That he loved her so much. It's sad, but I think there's very few marriages like that. And this is not to, uh, to make you feel uh, so upset with yourself that you can't live, but you know, or guilt, but you need to go to Christ and say, Lord, I realize that I need to love my wife like you love the church. I need to, I need to be the savior of the body. I need to, I need to be there for her. And I got a feeling that if you start treating your wife like that, she'll actually submit to you and everything will be in order. But I'll tell you what, if you're... <laughs> If you're not a spiritual head of your house, asking your wife to submit to you would be pure foolishness. She's spiritual. Because if you're not spiritual, you don't know. You can't lead. You can't lead in the right direction by the Holy Spirit because you don't even know the Holy Spirit. But I got a feeling it all works together if husbands would do what they're supposed to do. But I see it usually, it's, it's uh, the husbands are the, the culprit here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Now, how do we get cleansed? So many people think that, oh, I accept the Jesus Christ as Savior. I don't need the, the Word. I, I already got everything I need. I got it that, you know, in uh, 1982. I'm not saying I personally got it in 1982. But I'm saying that, you know, that as an example, somebody says, well, I got it all in 1982. No, you didn't. You might have gotten saved, but it says here that you must be sanctified and cleansed with the washing of the water of or by the word. In other words, when I read that, by the word is how you get washed. If you don't have the word, you don't have that cleansing going on. Why is he using the word to wash us that he, Christ, might present the church to himself as a glorious church. How many want to be in the glorious church? I want to be in the glorious church. Not having a spot or a wrinkle. That don't sound like me. I have spots and wrinkles. Now, most of my spots and wrinkles, my wife gets out because she does my laundry. Praise God. And, you know, if you don't have one of these, I would recommend you get one of these wives that will do those spot and <laughs> remove your spots and wrinkles because she does she irons too but uh what <laughs> go to the go to the south uh, then he presented to himself a glorious earth not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish now what he's telling you is if you're going to get there you got to be cleansed by the word victor have you ever taken a bath i'm not saying that because i smell you I'm just using you as an example. I hope you don't mind. But uh, you took a bath, what? When was the last time you took a bath? About two weeks ago? <laughs> Every day. Every day. Every day. I do too. Well, some days I skip. 
<laughs> which I shouldn't. My wife said, she looks at me in bed, she goes, did you take a shower? <laughs> you need to wash every day. And if the, wa- the washing is done by the word, what's he saying? You need the word every day. Getting it back in 1982 is not enough. You need to have it every day. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It should be holy and without blemish. And that's what I want to be. And if I want to go there, I got to have the words washing power in me every day to remove those spots, to remove those blemishes. Then he goes back to this thing about love. You you know, how many believe in the gifts of the Spirit? You believe in the gifts of the Spirit? But he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. But he, he, he gets into that conversation and he said, but let me show you something else here. Or let me show you a greater way. Because he said uh, there abides faith, hope, and love. Those are the eternal. Those are the eternal gifts. He said, if you got if you got tongues, if you're working in that ministry, you got to, those. Are one day they're going to pass away. If you got a gift of knowledge, that's going to pass away. But faith, hope, and love are going to last forever. And the greatest one is is love. You know, one thing I realize in my life is I'm deficient in love. I need more love. So please love me. No, no I need your love, but I need, I need to love also. And what I'm saying is the only one that can help me with that is God. And where you find an emptiness, but I'm saying this love thing, God says there's nothing greater than love. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Well, it makes sense because aren't you one body in marriage? Right? The two shall become one flesh, right? So men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Now there are some men that don't treat their wife like that. There's some men uh, will have their wife walk around in in uh, in holy. Well, now it's the fashion, you know, holy jeans and all. But uh, you know, in, in clothes that should have been thrown away or not even given to the goodwill, should be in a dumpster. And they'll, ju- I mean, they'll just dress to the hilt. Because who's this one following me? Oh, she's just the wife. And now when, and when you got the, the wife not working and wife staying home, a lot of husbands go, I'm the one that makes the money. It's going to be done my way. And, you know, he gets the new hat. He gets the new suit. He gets, the, you know. How many know that uh, the wife needs this and the wife needs that? And uh, the guy, I'll use myself for an example. The guy goes out and says, you know, I could really use a brand new guitar. That's not loving your, your, your wife when she has needs, and, and you're, you already, especially if you already got a guitar. You know what? My wife bought me my guitar. I didn't even ask her for it. I was surprised. It's the best dog on guitar I ever had. Wow. And she just surprised me with it. And I'll tell you what, it's a Gibson. That's a good guitar. She search, How long you search for that? I searched for a long time, and I saved it even longer. She found it. And you know, I brought that to church and been in that praise. I don't know how long I've been doing this now with that guitar. It never went out of tune. Now, that's a good guitar. He that loves his wife loves himself. And that makes sense because you're one. See, if everything's working right, you're one. And I'll tell you this right now. If you're fighting with your wife, your hair, your hairs, your prayers are here, are being hindered. You know, you, you, you think uh, you're going to pray and be heard of God and then all God's spirit is telling you while you're, while you're praying is why don't you go make peace with your wife? 
And if you're not thinking that, you, you better get a check in your spirit. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You see where he went? We were talking about the husband and wife. And we, we said that there were one body. And all of a sudden, he's got our focus on there. And he said, ah, but we are members of his body. Let me read that one before that. For no man ever yet hates his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. And he's saying, you want to know how he loves you? He, loved, he gave you that wife so you could learn all about love. He gave you one another so you could learn about... It's not easy two people living together. They got their own... I mean, my wife and I are, are completely like night and day, you know, like one's, one's headed north and one's headed... I know one's headed south. <laughs> and I'm from the north. She's from the south. So that's a good illustration. But I'm headed north. She's headed south. And, uh, you know, we're, we're planning on moving down south because that's what she wants to do, right? <laughs> so anyway, but, but he jumps, he says, we are members of his body. Now, I know you, you've heard this. I know you realize it, but, but do you really get what he's saying? Jesus ascended into heaven. We're, some of us, many of us, are looking towards the um, that sign in heaven that's supposed to take place. I think it's the, what the twenty seventh of September with Virgo with the crown on her head. In Revelation chapter twelve it says it has the same situation. You got the woman with her moon moon under her feet. The moon will be under her feet in the heavens. She'll have a, a crown of twelve stars. This Virgo in heaven is going to have a crown of twelve stars. The moon under her feet, and if you look at the the, uh, the scripture, it says that the, she brought forth a child, and her child is caught up to God's throne. Now that's the rapture. The child is who? The child is Christ. But right now, it's kind of weird. But the head went up first. See, the head is Christ. But where the head is, the body is going to be attached. That's one reason I think he's not coming down putting his feet on the, the Mount of Olives until you're connected to him. He said there's going to be a shout and we will rise up to meet him in the air. And then we will be the body. And where he is, we will always be. Why? Because we're members of his body. When he rules on the earth, we'll be ruling with him because we're members of his body. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, we've kind of gotten ahead of this because we talked about this already. But he says, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, what he's saying is all the way back to Adam and Eve, what God was trying to paint, the picture God was trying to paint is Christ and the church. Adam was first, then Eve, then his wife. God took a rib right out of Adam's chest and made that wife. So she would be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And I don't know if you've heard this, but God didn't take it out of his toe so that man could put his feet on the wife. He didn't take a, he didn't take a part of his brain so she could rule it over him. She took it out of his heart. Right, right, right over that rib cage. It protects the heart. He took a little piece of that and he made wife. 
Now, I don't think he uses the whole rib. Some people thought that men have one less rib than a woman, but science shows us all you got to do is, is wait till somebody dies and dig them up, and you'll find out that uh, they have just as many ribs. But I'm not telling you to go out and do that. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is the word of God. I've noticed something about the word of God. See, I, sometimes I get into the discussions about people say, well, what about the Ten Commandments? What about this? Do you think there's Ten Commandments and then everything else are suggestions? Word of God is the word of God. It's all commandments. God's not telling you, you know, this is my suggestion. You can do what you want, but this is my suggestion. He's giving you advice, and you're supposed to implement it. What does your, what does your boss do at work when he tells you to do something? You better do it, right? 